L483 here at uh, Penn State's World Campus. I just wanted to welcome you to this week, uh, week three, and just again, so you get a little bit of a visual from me, so you can uh, uh, see your instructor as we go through this course week to week. So just a couple of admin notes, I've put you in your groups. Uh, that'll become more apparent as we get later on in the semester, but if there's any issues with those groups, please let me know when you should be contacting uh, your fellow students there. So I also want to discuss current events, and obviously the Manchester bombing, what happened last week, is the biggest thing that's been on the news uh, for this past week. And the one thing to consider is uh, this development that keeps going on and on about people being on the radar, whether they're in the United States, whether they're in Britain or in France or in Belgium, uh, the perpetrators are known to authorities. Um, and this is what I call the, the terrorism gap. So we know that somebody is doing something wrong, bad. They're surfing on an ISIS website. They're thinking about traveling. They've shown elements of being radicalized, but there's not enough to arrest them. So you have this gap in between where people can, can plan and do things, but still not be touched by authorities. Uh, you know, I've heard different things, whether it's the Fort Hood shooting, the first Fort Hood shooting in 2009, the Orlando shooting. You know, what, why didn't we know about these people? And the simple fact is they were. Some of them were on watch lists, including the Boston Marathon bombers, but they didn't do anything to get arrested. Um, and I suspect this person here in, in Manchester... Uh, he didn't do anything until he strapped on that bomb and entered that concert hall. Uh, Nadal Hassan didn't do anything illegal or arrestable until he started to open fire in that uh, uh, soldier processing center at Fort Hood. The Orlando shooter, he might have done some illegal stuff, but nothing that can detain him long term for terrorism until he started opening fire at that. Uh, shooting area or that that club in Orlando so this is the one issue that's been plaguing people and one thing to consider is how do we I, I call it triage um, you know there's not enough police or federal investigators to monitor people 24 hour 7 whether they're on the no-fly list whether they're on the the terrorism watch list there's not enough resources to do that so when does someone deserve further scrutiny, 24-hour-7 scrutiny? Uh, when do they deserve wiretaps? When does their internet uh, history deserve to be uh, intruded upon by federal authorities? Uh, that's going to be the question. And the Manchester, I'm going to, again, there's probably still a little bit of information out there that hasn't been collected, but it looks like this guy went to Libya and came back. Now, again, Britain's a free country, and you're allowed to travel to hostile zones, but he did travel to a hostile zone and come back. He should have been not just on radar, but have gotten further scrutiny when he came back. Um, and that will be the question to look at as we get more information on the Manchester bombing in the days and weeks to come. So just consider that, that gap between when someone has shown elements of radicalization and when somebody can do something arrest upon. If, the, if you think this is limited to ISIS or Islamic extremism, just yesterday we had an incident on the West Coast in Portland where it appears that a right-wing extremist killed two people because uh, those two people were defending someone who was being on the receiving end of a, a uh, anti-Islamic tirade or a racist tirade. Um, and it appears he was on the radar screen. He was known to be right-wing extremist, but again, he falls in that gap between what is showing extremism, what may show radicalization, and what we can do to arrest them, and that's a very difficult thing to do in a free society. So, with that being said, um, just keep your, your work getting on. You, you have, uh, getting back to the class, uh, please hand, keep handing in your assignment. I should have your assignment two back to you uh, this week. Um, if you had issues with it, I, I let you know. Uh, but so far, I think everything's everything's okay. And then this week, we're going to th talk about uh, concepts and models of policy making. Um, and we're going to ask the question: uh, you, You're going to get the Cuban Missile Crisis as your your national security case study. 
And the question comes up, okay, how were the decisions made? How did President Kennedy at the time, you know, uh, incorporated his advisors, the mixing of, of, of opinions uh, to produce uh, a good policy? Or could it have gone wrong under a different president? And this, again, we assume, one of the things to look at for the Cuban Missile Crisis, we assume everyone's rational. We assume that our, our national security leaders, our political leaders are rational. But we came very close to, to a thermonuclear war that would have killed millions of people uh, over Cuba. And you can imagine the day after a nuclear war when there's massive death and suffering and people are going to ask, we fought this over Cuba? We are, con we are kind of going down that road now where, you know, it's talking about escalation conflicts in the Baltics, in Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia. And again, if those issues escalate, the question is going to come up. We fought a world war or we fought a massive conflict over Lithuania. We fought a massive conflict that might cause a million casualties in Korea over South Korea. Uh, just think about, again... You're seeing this this decision making live on the Korean Peninsula regarding North Korea. I think, are we acting rationally uh, with the best information possible? So keep that in mind as you're going through uh, lesson three, and I look forward to your points on the discussion board.